I was in LA, it was 2007, and I'd just finished writing um, Triangle, and we were just trying to get Triangle made. And so my brain, I think, was in a very structural form, and the film Disturbia had just been in the cinema, and someone, one of the Hollywood execs, said to me, you know, we should try and do a film of Strangers on a Train. And I started to come up with ideas and thinking, you know, and then before, you know, within a few minutes, I'd said, well, what happens if the two stories structurally break based upon a decision to either kill or not kill? And we think we've got a version that stays at home and a version that goes off to do the murder. And then very quickly, you know, like that, I came up with, you know, I won't call it a twist, but the kind of the way that story could end. And that became almost the formula for how I would approach the film, very similar to... I, you know, I built a story around the twist in Triangle where the girl sees herself looking back on herself. I then had to load a film, you know, character and plot into that. The same thing happened with this. I had the, the basic twist, the basic idea, and now I had to sort of populate it with characters. T'as fait le bon choix. Si t'étais resté, tu serais chez toi en train d'imaginer ce qui aurait pu se passer au lieu de le vivre. <coughs> J'ai une devise. Regrette jamais ce que tu fais. Et toujours ce que tu fais pas. C'est pas vrai, Cherry? I'm just writing a film now called The Judas Goat, which is exactly the same. I, I love that stuff. And I love set pieces and I love surprises. Um, I was chatting to someone yesterday that I must do more comedy stuff because, like, Severance and, and Get Santa is. So, but I find there's fun to be had in genre that I'm, I laugh and we, we laugh at scenes that are twisted. And that's the same for me, almost, it's the same pleasure as laughing. Surprise in a horror movie is like a joke. A good jump is like a joke because the audience laugh. So actually the, the, the emotional human response are, are similar between laughter and screaming in a way. But what's, where, I think the hardest films are when you see these great searing dramas that someone's made and, you know, everyone's silent in the cinema, the, the credits come up, and you, did they enjoy it? You know, it's very hard to know until you see the box office or the reviews, so. When I was pitching it, and when I was, before I actually started to write it, that that would come later, that it would be the sort of end of act two. And it comes almost at the midway point, maybe a bit after, it's a, uh, so it has a strange feeling because you actually feel as though you've answered a lot of the story and then the film moves forward again in another way. Uh, so that's kind of odd for an audience. And I, 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 that happened in the writing. I, I felt as though, and it does happen in the movie, that, that people get very disrupted by the idea of two things to watch. And I guess the only negative of, it's not a negative for me, but the... When, you, when it's a thriller, it's very hard to engage in two simultaneous stories in a thrilling way. So I realised very soon that I'd have to get these, these stories back on track and, or more aligned so that you don't spend the whole movie uh, reflecting on it r rather than being involved and enjoying it. So that was why it, it comes earlier and maybe the, the twist, shall we say. It's got a a dreamy quality to it, hasn't it? It feels, um, I think the lenses have a little bit to do with that. I think again, the problem is, uh, not the problem, but the strength of it is, and the reason why it works counter to your intuition or your instinct is because gradually you, you start to reflect in the film that the characters are not who they should be or could be, that the, the guy you thought was bad is not bad, the guy you thought was good is not good. And so, and that is, is made, is laid out to you, I think, in the sort of idea that you have time to reflect on it, um, rather than being racing the whole way through the, the film. So I think that, yeah, that's one of the things that I found as I was making the film. I think it's in the script as well. I think that's a kind of, that laconic vibe comes from me loving those kind of blood simple and, Films like that, where you, you get time to think about stuff in a movie. I, a friend, my French friend that I was at film school with, 
said sometimes films that put you to sleep in the cinema keep you up at night. And I think, <laughs> not saying it's that, but, but giving sometimes, giving something a bit of time to breathe is, uh, is more interesting, I think. What I'm most pleased with in Detour is that we kept that structural element very non-tricksy. It's very kind of linear, and then you and then you and then by the time those stories have reached their you know sit, you know halfway conclusion, shall we say, you've got a another understanding of the characters as they move forward. So it landed more squarely on the character, I think, than, than Triangle did. We, we, we made a decision very early on to try and give it, because it was going to be colour, it's going to be a sort of modern, you know, neo-noir world, that we would film the whole thing on very wide-angle lenses. And, and I asked my DP, I said, what's the, you know, what will be the, the downsides of really following that and saying, OK, we're not going to shoot on anything over a 20, you know, I think 25 mil was our longest lens. And, you know, he explained that if you're doing a scene like this, uh, a shot, reverse shot, tele, you know, scene, you couldn't do over shoulder because it would look as though you're miles away. And, the, and so we, we had to change the language. And I found it very, uh, instead of restricting, I found it very stylistically uh, useful in a way because it made me be conscious of why I was doing a shot. Sometimes in film, it's very easy to quickly get every single character and get a camera there, get a camera there. Before you know it, you've got more footage than you need. You've got less style than you want. So it was a kind of a decision based upon, let's give this a strong visual look that emphasizes the landscape and the, uh, and yet, and let's and it'll also stick to it so that it becomes a cohesive style. And, and that's really what I think makes the film so beautiful. I, 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 and it may well be something I push forward with on a number of films, but I couldn't do that same style in, for example, the Judas Goat where it's going to be in a, shot in a really rainy... It, could, it might work because a lot of it is in the countryside. Yeah, it could do. It's, it's hard just to, to find your you know, visual grammar, I think. And that's one of the things that I think, for, for me personally, from film to film, is improving. Um, I think the spirit of all the films is staying the same, the, the twists are staying the same, but I think the, the technique is, I think, improving to the point, but, but whether the chaos is, whether, you know, do, do the audience want technique or does just the filmmaker want technique? And I get so many people come up to me and they want me to sign for Creep, you know, Creep is their favourite film. And for me, it's the, it's the one where I, you know, I'm the newest in my head. It's the, it's the rawest of my films, but... Yeah, the films I'm more more proud of, are, I guess, are the ones that are where I've yeah technically are more technical. It's like a dream. It's like a, if you say what are the movies I have to make in my life that I'd love to make, and you can see all the directors doing it. Look at Tarantino. You sort of go, I want to make a western, tick. You know, I want to make a film with Nazis, <laughs> tick. Tarantino's done it. I have all the same obsessions. You know, there's something. Yeah, that, that, that we all get drawn to, is those stories. It's hard to do road movies here. I think you can do it, I've, I've seen it done well in France. Um, obviously you guys will have a different perspective. We all, we all have a different perspective of our own national cinema. Uh, but films like, um, what was the Patrice Lacan film I really enjoyed? That was the, 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 where you hit the road. There's, because you, you, what's it called? Dondema. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you've got the, the, the kind of changing landscapes, it does work. Um, uh, with, our, with England, it's all very, a road movie is, there's so many petrol stations, there's so many, you know, <laughs> that you don't really get lost in any wilderness. Uh, and America is just phenomenal for that. Yeah, the American noir, the road movie, the, you know, the, the whole idea of a uh, trip to, from LA to Vegas, it's, it's a kind of European boy's dream. And all the cliches that I want in it, like the dusty, um, you know, ca uh, petrol station with the old Mexican guy sat outside. Unfortunately, most of those petrol stations are gone. You know, you, you don't find them. And we, uh, and you know, the tumbleweed that comes in, 
I was driving, we were driving the car during filming and I was like, stop, stop, there's a tumbleweed, quickly. So we were doing this, I ran out to think I was going to hold this tumbleweed. These things, I don't know if you've seen one, they're, they're like bramble bushes about this big and you touch them, your fingers get cut. And I didn't realise that, so I'd grab it and ah! It, it depends. If I've, if I've been given a script, I often just dig into it and start to... It may remind me of a film I saw or a feeling in a movie or a scene in a movie. Usually it's films, not music. And, and then I'll start to get a, a sense. Um, I, I always wanted with Black Death, I always read it and felt like it would be interesting to... Certainly after the, the technical symmetry and, uh, you know, the real restrictive nature in the end. Not restrictive in a bad way, but of triangle. But it was so driven by the camera and the plot and uh, everything had to look the same because the loop's going to repeat. That I wanted there to be almost a sort of embedded journalistic feel to Black Death. And I thought I'd never seen that on a medieval story and get the cameras in there. So that kind of came about as a response, I think, to the film I'd made before and then reading the script. Um, and, and some movies are m much more uh, straightforward in a way that it, if I'm making Get Santa and I want to make a movie that is for children, I feel, uh, you know, I f I, I feel that the classical you know, Spielberg 80s style, as much as I could achieve it with the limited means that we have on our budgets would be the right way. And, I, and again, you should never reach higher than you can afford. So to try and find a, uh, an affordable balance is always the yes, more pragmatic side. So I've always liked nutcase characters. I think, I think that's the key. I mean, I, I think, you know, again, we can mention, I could talk about Tarantino all day long, but if you, you know, any of his films have always done that. You know, the great scene that he wrote for True Romance is one of the, that scene between Walken and everyone says one of the greatest scenes ever. It's two completely ballsy nutcase men. And I think that comes from the hard-boiled noir world as well. That, that, that's where it all comes from. Um, I mean, I love those films. The, the, why aren't there more of those films? And this is one of the more depressing elements of where independent cinema is finding itself. If, the, if, if films like Detour, if little thrillers, you know, like Pusher, the, the Nicholas Reffin winding film, if those aren't the, f the, the staple for independent cinema, along with horror movies and, you know, maybe indie art movies, then what, what is independent cinema? I think those films are the, the lifeblood of it in a way. And it still happens, but it's very hard to get them out. And if you look at Paris as an example, when we came to Paris in the 90s, me and my wife, we would come a lot when we were only students. We'd get there, we'd stay in a cheap hotel, we'd open up the 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 newspaper to see what's on and there'd be this you know a hundred little cinemas and then one of them would be showing a Robert Altman season and one of them is showing a they're all gone and so you really and I think that's the, a great tragedy for France because because by the time in the 90s they most of those cinemas had, had gone from London Paris was still doing it and I'm sure I'm sure it's still better but it's nowhere near like it was so I think we've lost that Well, I won't say it's easier. I think it's it's the same. I think it would have been easier. But I think the financial mar uh, world is definitely tougher than it was when I started out. We had the British Film Council that could put lots of money in, so there were there were definitely more avenues. Uh, but now I've got because I've got I've made films. Uh, it's it's easier to yeah. But providing you're making the the right sort of movie. I mean, I. The way I've uh, <clears throat> approached this now is that I've gone, right, okay, I'm going to go and start. You know, I haven't made a horror movie now for a, a while. So I've got two films, another one called The Banishing that I'm going to do. So I'm just going to make some, you know, I'm going to say, okay, if I want to get on the side of a bus and I want to get into a big mainstream cinema again, which I do, and I want to make films for the cinema, then make a film that will definitely be in the cinema, a big horror movie, which is easy to sell. So, <clears throat> and I'm, that's great for me. So I'm lucky in that respect. Because of the new platforms, I think the idea of a limited release with a, um, with a VOD, um, you know, a nice big VOD company releasing it as well, is, is probably in today's market the right platform for it. Obviously, we would have preferred to have been all over the cinemas, but 
I, so, so that as long as that still finds a way of, of recouping for the financier, that's all I really, you know, I want, I want people that put money in my films to get their money back. I, you know, at the very least, get their money back and hopefully make a profit. So, I, I love shooting all my movies. I, I, I don't like the gaps in between. I wish I could make a film a year, and I'm working hard at the moment to try and achieve that. <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, this idea of going off for six years and writing your next opus is like, it's not for me because it drives you crazy. You're on your own. I'm surprised. I'm grateful that, because obviously Tarantino, again, to quote him, must like writing it as well because, you know, he does spend that time. But I, I don't. I wish that I was given script after script after script to make. Yeah, I'd like to be on set all the time. I like to sort of look forward to the shoot ending. And then within about three or four weeks, I'm trying to get back on set again to do another one. Tu fais une connerie, ma belle! Une putain de connerie! Non, t'en dis, connard, balance ton flingue! But c'est enculé! Non! Putain! Non, le tue pas! Non, 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 écoute-le, me tue pas, pas pitié! Putain, me tue pas! Putain, jette ton okay, flingue! Ok, voilà, c'est fait, d'accord? Pitié, j'ai une femme et un gosse, je veux juste rentrer chez moi! Jette aussi les clés des okay, menottes! Ok, prenez les clés et allez-vous-en, d'accord? Prenez les clés! Voilà! Ok? Écoutez, j'ai une femme et un gosse qui m'attendent. Je veux juste rentrer chez moi, ok File-moi cette putain de radio Tenez, voilà, elle est à vous. Je veux pas avoir d'ennui. Baissez votre flingue, ok Monte dans le coffre. Non, je monte pas dans ce coffre. Monte dans ce putain de coffre. Monte dans ce putain de coffre Ok, ok. Monte, putain D'accord 